The Battle of Okinawa is etched in history as one of the most gruesome conflicts in the Pacific theater. Beginning in 1944, with the capture of Ariana Island, B-29 bombers could fly over mainland Japan. On November 17, 1944, the Allies initiated bombing campaigns on cities and strategic points across the heart of the Japanese Empire. Then came March 9, 1945, where the most destructive bombing raid in human history occurred, the fire bombings of Tokyo, Operation Meeting House. In one night, between 90,000 and 100,000 people were killed. Despite this, Japan showed no signs of surrendering. After the capture of Iwo Jima, the Americans turned their attention to their springboard for a final invasion of Japan. This island was Okinawa, a volcanic island 400 miles southwest of the mainland. The invasion of Okinawa quickly swelled to become the largest U.S. invasion of the war. For the defenses of Okinawa, the Imperial Army Ministry placed General Mitsuru Ushijima in command of what became the 32nd Army. Ushijima was one of the few in the Japanese army who actively opposed the prevailing militarist opinion that war with the United States was the best way to preserve Japan's expansionist rights. His chief of staff was young and certainly far more progressive in his views than his seniors, Colonel Hiromichi Yahara. Together, they devised a deep, well-organized defensive strategy for Okinawa. They would predominantly focus their defenses on the south, as best to draw out American forces away from the northern parts of the island, thus expending more of their resources. A war of attrition became their doctrine. This strategy contradicted beliefs held by the older military class and many young, fanatical militarists. They believed a defensive battle was cowardly, and swift and violent attacks were the best way to defeat the enemy. The boisterous and fanatical General Isamu Cho was the most vocal adversary to Colonel Yahara's battle of attrition. He actively opposed many of Colonel Yahara's directives and persuaded General Ushijima to launch a disastrous attack on May 5, 1945. The results with thousands of badly needed Japanese soldiers needlessly being slaughtered, and Okinawa's defenses, already heavily outmanned and outgunned, were now more so. The Japanese 32nd Army fired 13,000 artillery rounds in support of this attack, but American artillery quickly overpowered anything the Japanese had to offer. A Japanese soldier recorded in his diary, quote, The time of attack has finally come. I have my doubts as to whether this all-out offensive will succeed, but I will fight fiercely with the thought in mind that this war for the Empire will last a hundred years. Colonel Yahara viewed this unsuccessful offensive as the fatal blow to the 32nd Army, and consequently, the overall defense of Okinawa. 32nd Army HQ had established their headquarters in a chamber deep below Shuri Castle. As the Americans approached from the north, the 32nd Army would withdraw to Hill 89, or Mabuni Hill, overlooking the village of the same name. Despite torrential downpours and monsoon, the Japanese 32nd Army relocated, marching through waist-deep mud and adhering closely to Colonel Yahara's original defensive strategy. By mid-June, with manpower and resources at an all-time low, the Japanese prepared for the final battle and the ultimate end of the Okinawan campaign. Colonel Yahara, deep inside Mabuni Hill, and the others within Ushijima and Cho's staff, waited with apprehension knowing that soon their commanding generals would decide to commit Harakiri. This story depicts the final few days of the 32nd Army from the Japanese perspective. With a disclaimer, much of the information that will be disclosed comes from the memoirs of Colonel Yahara. His memoir remains the best first-hand account of Ushijima's staff during those final days. Thus it relies heavily on memory, which can easily be distorted through a number of factors. With this in mind, I have tried my best to shuffle through what might be personal bias and self-preservation from Colonel Yahara's perspective. This is my attempt to decipher what happened inside Mabuni Hill from June 19th to June 22nd, 1945.
Word had spread through the caves of General Ushijima and General Cho's decision to die. General Ushijima and General Cho hosted the staff for a final meal together, where they dined heartily. We dined in the staff officer's room, which was big enough for all of us. Two candles dimly lit the room. We were served fish, canned pineapple, an imperial gift of one bottle of sake, and awamori, Okinawan rice brandy. Despite General Cho's attempts to lighten the mood, a heavy atmosphere settled in the caves, most weary of what lay in their immediate future. Colonel Yahara made sure to dress nicely for the following days, and many staff officers knew what was coming. Many were determined to witness their suicides, considering it an honor and privilege to see their two senior officers die by Harakiri. Once the suicides happened, it was decided the staff would all escape the tunnels and act independently. Many assumed false names and occupations should they be captured by the rapidly approaching Americans. Even as they discussed their plans, the sounds of artillery and gunfire grew increasingly intense. Most of the soldiers standing guard were merely 16 and 17 year olds. Some of these troops and their officers changed into Okinawan garb to disguise themselves as civilians. They all carried a small bag of white rice, two dried fish, and two days worth of dried bread, canned fish, salt, and a first aid kit. At this point, General Ushijima changed out of his fatigues and into his best uniform, which mud and grime nevertheless had stained. He readied his swords, writing his last messages to the troops and the Emperor. Meanwhile, the first of the General's staff had begun to evacuate. The cave walls were now trembling, the American artillery barrage getting worse, making it nearly impossible to escape the caves below Mabuni Hill. One officer, Nagano, the youngest of the general staff, clad in his Okinawan clothing, looked out through the main exit, seeing artillery fire up ahead. He shook in fear, watching, breathing, preparing for the inevitable. Colonel Yahara approached him from behind, and the colonel was determined to stay until the last possible moment. Turning to face Yahara, Nagano shouted, I'll take the lead! Long live the Emperor! He then charged out of the cave, a few other officers following. This continued for a couple of hours, with troops disappearing through the exits. Some lived, but most had died. But Yahara, true to his word, stayed. He wandered about the caves, looking into the empty rooms, the abandoned photographs, the personal belongings of so many soldiers and officers who could no longer take them. By around midnight, Yahara heard a commotion. He found several horribly wounded and disheveled troops from an artillery regiment seeking refuge within the caves. The orders were to stay in the fortifications overlooking Mabuni Hill. Instead of senselessly dying for a lost cause, most of these men, no older than 17 years old, cried, wallowed, all of them terrified. Colonel Yahara approached the senior officer and presented General Ushijima's official order for them. He wanted them back on the hill, but knew how hopeless of a position they found themselves in. Despite this, several of the artillerymen left the caves, returning to their fortifications, fighting to the death, all in the name of their emperor. Dawn had come on June 20th, 1945. In one of his last orders, General Ushijima wanted those on mainland Japan to grasp the dire situation rapidly unfolding on Okinawa. It read as follows. To General Kojawada of the 23rd Artillery Group, you will send Commander Sunano and two other officers to mainland Japan to report the local battle situation, after which they will join in the final decisive battle for Japan. Ushijima knew that the battle for Okinawa was effectively over. Once again, Japan had lost a fight to the Americans. At this point, one must wonder what exactly he was thinking. Was he perhaps contemplating the irony of the whole situation? After all, he had been one of the few in the Japanese Imperial Army to oppose going to war with the United States. It seemed his fears of Japan's total destruction were coming true. Rather than naming someone to command what little remained of the Japanese 32nd Army, Ushijima allowed the commanders to make their own choices. If they wished to partake in a final suicide attack and die, they could. If they wanted to surrender, they could. If they wanted to initiate guerrilla warfare against the Americans, they may do so. To Ushijima, it must have all seemed so pointless at this stage. 
Colonel Yahara and Sonano decided now was the time to discuss the logistics of the senior officers committing suicide. Yahara thought it would be best for them to end their lives atop Mabuni Hill, allowing the remaining staff to dispose of their bodies in the East China Sea. Sunano did not like any of the ideas, but didn't think Yahara or he had any alternative but to leave Ushijima and Cho's bodies inside the caves, with the Americans actively attacking them as they spoke. After all, the terrain made it so that the American tanks could only come from one direction, the east, which meant the very caves these two men stood would be the first they encountered. This might bottleneck the Americans long enough for the remaining staff to escape to the west. The heavily depleted artillery positions overlooking the east could still rain hellfire upon the enemy Shermans. Some more organized artillery units would pull back toward Oro Village for a better defense. Later that day, a communications officer delivered an official telegram from Imperial Army Headquarters in Tokyo, sent by General Koichika Anami, the Imperial Army's war minister. It read, quote, For three months, the 32nd Army has fought bravely under General Ushijima, a commander with great nobility of character. They killed the enemy commander, General Simon Buckner, and delivered deadly blows against the eight divisions of troops. Your troops struggled hard, preparing superbly for a decisive battle. As the enemy's strength increased, your troops, officers, and men responded with vows to destroy that strength. The letter helped alleviate some of the tensions the two generals might have experienced. To them, including Colonel Yahara, the telegram validated their defensive decisions, and those on the mainland would perceive their actions on Okinawa as honorable. As Yahara put it, The Okinawa operation had been doomed from the start, but I knew that we had far surpassed Imperial Headquarters' expectations. They had also managed to eliminate the American commanding officer before Ushijima and Cho had taken their own lives. Japan viewed this as a moral victory, and thus all the Japanese who had died fighting on Okinawa were made worth it. Here, General Cho, who had drunk much of the sake earlier in the day, dictated his final thoughts on paper. Against the overwhelmingly powerful enemy, without survivors at hand, as we were about to make an all-out suicide attack, we received the commendation letter bestowed by Your Excellency. Nothing can surpass this glory. We are supremely moved. The soldiers who have died shedding their blood on these islands of Okinawa can now rest in peace forever. The remaining soldiers at this final stand are encouraged to fight to the death. With all our strength, we will fight bravely so that we will come up to your expectations. We are very grateful. Any optimism felt that evening was dashed on June 21st. The Americans swamped into Mabuni village, their tanks leading the way, and began to attack the Japanese rear guard. Colonel Yahara, who could see the situation unfolding from the caves, found it peculiar that the American infantry had halted within the village, interpreting the soldiers as digging in. Instead, the Americans were burying the heaps of Japanese and Okinawan dead, the bodies rotting in the humidity. American soldiers of the 32nd Infantry Division grabbed one of their officer prisoners to send a message to General Ushijima in the hopes to get him to surrender. The Japanese officer traversed up Mabuni Hill and was about to reach one of the many entrances to the cave. Instead of allowing him in, with fear of a possible American ambush, the Japanese defenders blew the entrance to the cave from the inside. In response, the Americans began using flamethrowers, both on foot and with their tanks. It took over 5,000 gallons of gasoline before the flamethrowers eradicated any resistance atop Mabuni Hill. By June 22nd, the battle for Mabuni Village had reached its end. Americans breached the final machine gun entrenchments, and flamethrowers snuffed out any remaining resistance. Other Japanese defenders faced grenades, or being run over by Sherman tanks. This did not bode well for the general staff still remaining in the caves overlooking the village. Inside were still several men and women, too wounded to evacuate. They all awaited their fates, their time on this earth, about to end. Their apprehension seemed destined when a sharp explosion rocked the entire HQ. Colonel Yahara timidly ran to the entrenchments and was greeted by a wounded comrade. The man reported, The hill is completely occupied by the enemy. They exploded a satchel charge of the main shaft. There are many casualties around General Cho's quarters. 
The lights began to flicker at this time, the Americans aiming their artillery directly atop the caves. Except for the central portions, all electricity had eventually been cut. The only way for anyone to see was by using kerosene lamps and flashlights. Some of the final assaults out of the Mabuni Caves were about to commence. A Lieutenant Akinaga led several of his men up Mabuni Hill for a suicide charge. Once they crested the hill, they all began lobbing grenades at the nearby Americans. The Japanese soldiers were quickly gunned down before they could do much damage. In the process, several live grenades ended up rolling in the opposite direction and toward the caves. The explosions sent shrapnel, dust, and smoke in every direction, wounding several of the soldiers guarding General Ushijima and General Cho. One grenade also landed close to several cowering Okinawan civilians. This horrifically mutilated two young girls, and they unfortunately lived. A nearby army medic decided to give them an injection of cyanide, which would end their suffering. After Akinaga's failed attack, the Americans officially occupied the Mabuni Hill summit. Both General Ushijima and Cho had yet to commit harakiri, but they had begun to prepare themselves, both men wishing to die on the territory the Americans now sat upon. Both generals agreed to order another suicide attack to reclaim Mabuni summit. The soldiers prepared themselves to obey this order, to fight to the last man. Colonel Yihara described the general thoughts at the time. Exhausted, I wanted only rest. Mortification and regret tormented me. Generals Ushijima and Cho had generously ordered me to return home and join the final battle of Japan. Could a senior staff officer abandon two great generals and thousands of comrades and escape to Japan? If I did return to the homeland, what would people say? They would surely give me the cold shoulder. Should I give up the homeland mission and die gracefully with my comrades? These thoughts help explain the mentality of most officers fighting in the Imperial Japanese Army, and why so many chose suicide rather than retreat. In many ways, the propaganda exclaiming loyalty and bravery for the Emperor helped hasten Imperial Japan's ultimate destruction. Yahara was of a new generation of Japanese military minds. His plan, as explained before, didn't bode well with the more traditional Japanese mindset. Fighting a defensive battle? No. Fighting while sitting was not the honorable way to fight. It was better to die charging, on the offensive, smiting the enemy with any and all means. This included using civilians as human shields, or women strapped with live bombs charging into the hordes of American soldiers, or children laying down with mines strapped to their bodies for an American tank to run over. Most Japanese saw this as the honorable way to fight. General Cho, Colonel Yahara's harshest critic, approached him and told the young staff officer that he had his blessing to leave for the mainland. This surprised Yahara. Cho had shown great disdain for him both before and throughout the Okinawan campaign. Deciding to stay until the last possible moment, Yahara did not want to abandon his post while his two commanders remained alive. Cho! With the moon rising over Mabuni Hill, the final suicidal assault began, comprising of one major, ten soldiers, ten adjutants, and one detachment of the 24th Engineering Regiment. From the tunnels, Colonel Yahara watched the soldiers individually disappear into the darkness outside. Aware that this attack, like so many others, would fail, he anticipated needless casualties among the Japanese soldiers, preventing them from fighting another day. As predicted, the assault was quickly gunned down by entrenched Americans. Any false hopes the Japanese had of retaking the summit were dashed once and for all. Colonel Yahara reported this to both Ushijima and Cho, the two generals saddened by this news. Around 3 o'clock a.m. on June 23rd, both Ushijima and Cho finally decided to commit harakiri in the morning. Cho finished his whiskey, while Ushijima remained meditative. The two had a brief discussion on their next course of action. Cho said to Ushijima in a familiar, arrogant, and confident tone, General, did you take a good rest? I waited patiently for you to waken, for time is running out. I could not sleep well because you snored so loudly. It was like thunder. Cho laughed, then grew somber. <laughs> Who will go first, you or me? Shall I die first and lead you to another world? 
Ushijima shook his head. I will take the lead. Here, Ushijima wrote two poems, a common practice before committing harakiri. Green grass of Yukushima, withered before autumn, will return in the spring to Mokikoku. We spend arrows and bullets to stain heaven and earth, defending our homeland forever. General Cho's read as follows. The devil force tightly grips our southwest land. His aircraft fill the sky, his ships control the sea. Bravely, we fought for ninety days inside a dream. We have used up our withered lives, but our souls race to heaven. Come daylight, as discussed, both Ushijima and Cho readied their final acts. Both sat silently on their knees, swords ready to slice their bellies. Yet, with electricity gone within the caves, it remained too dark for the Harakiri assistants to see. They agreed to wait a little longer until the sun shone into the tunnel's mouth. Once the sun had risen enough, fittingly rising as the imperial flag depicted, Ushijima was the first to stab himself with his sword. A gunshot rang out, sending panic momentarily through the caves, the staff afraid of an American assault. However, it was another one of Yahara's friends, the man with a pistol in hand and a fresh bullet hole in the back of his skull. It was deemed Ushijima had sliced himself enough, and the assistant successfully beheaded him. Cho then followed, his assistant swiftly doing the same. Their bloody, lifeless corpses lay on the muddy ground, deep under the earth. Yahara marked the time, noting the following. A glorious end to our three months of hard battle, our proud 32nd army, and the lives of our generals. It was 0430, June 23rd, 1945. Fighting continued on Okinawa for quite some time after the deaths of Uchijima and Cho. Colonel Yahara had successfully escaped the Mabuni Caves and tried to organize some semblance of a defense. This quickly fell apart, the Japanese commanders too independent and far apart for a proper direction. Some commenced guerrilla warfare, others suicide attacks. A few adhered to Colonel Yahara's original deep defensive strategy. Colonel Yahara, with his command hiding in a rocky cave, was captured by attacking American forces on June 26th, just three days after Ushijima and Cho had killed themselves. With the deaths of Ushijima and Cho, what remained of the Japanese defenses and their centralization quickly broke down. Officially, with their deaths, the Battle of Okinawa ended, on June 22nd, 1945. The battle was a disaster for Imperial Japan, an empire already beginning its death rattle. For the Japanese army, over 75,000 were killed. Over 30,000 Okinawan conscripts had also died, and somewhere between 7,000 and 15,000 Japanese soldiers were captured. But the horrors arose with civilian casualties, with numbers as high as 150,000 killed. Japanese Army HQ had wanted to make Okinawa a hellscape for the Americans, and a demonstration and precursor to what an invasion of the home islands would look like. While Okinawa was lost, the Imperial Japanese Army succeeded in its intentions. The Allies, having grown war-weary in the final months of the war, were appalled by the casualties accumulated on Okinawa, in total, America suffered over 55,000 casualties taking these islands. As estimates and plans were drawn up for the inevitable invasion of Japan, the Allies sought alternate means to finally force Japan to surrender. And the rest was history.